يا ربنا الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله تعالى وسلم وبارك على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته الغر الميامين اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القران المجيد والفرقان الحميد فقرأوا ما تيسر من القرآن صدق الله مولانا العظيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وصل عليه سلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا سيدي يا نبي الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا سيدي يا رحمة للعالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutations, peace and blessings upon the best of creation the jewel and crown of creation, the beloved of Allah Almighty the coolness to our eyes, the purpose of our lives, the revival of our hearts, the inspirer to our minds, the awakening of our souls, the most honored one, the most praised one, the most generous one, the most kind one, undoubtedly he is the most beautiful one. None other than Sayyiduna wa Nabiyuna Muhammadur Rasulullah. صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم From the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم Till our time today Allah سبحانه وتعالى has sent Many great personalities, many great individuals, many great men and women, pious, religious, righteous men and women to support, to protect, to defend, to propagate the religion of Islam. From the earliest generations, no doubt, the greatest from them all were the companions, the Sahaba. The Sahaba are those chosen blessed individuals, male and female, who lived in the time of the Prophet Wasallam, who believed in him, accepted Islam, met the Prophet Wasallam, and then passed away on this belief. From them, we know that many of the great Sahaba, like Sayyiduna Ali ibn Abi Talib, Sayyiduna Uthman ibn Affan, Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiyallahu ta'ala anhum. Many great female companions, like Sayyiduna Aisha, bint al-Siddiq, radiyallahu ta'ala anha. And 
سیدہ خدیجت القبرا سیدہ ام سلمہ سیدہ جویریہ سیدہ فاطمت الزہراء سلام اللہ علیہ و رضی اللہ تعالی عنہم اجمعین These are some of the greatest women from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. After their time, many great students of days, known as the Tabi'een, the successors, those who followed the companions after them, those who children were Muslim, the Sahaba's children, may be born after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's physical presence in this world. After the passing of the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, there were many great tabi'een, many great successors. For example, we have Sayyidina Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, Sayyiduna Qasim bin Muhammad, Sayyiduna Rabi'at al-Ra'i. We have Sayyiduna Hassan al-Basari. We have Sayyiduna Uwais al-Qarni. These are some of the most prominent, prominent men who lived after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and were the next generation of Muslims. So the first generation of Muslims were who? The Sahaba, the companions. The second generation were who? The Tabi'een. These who followed the Sahaba, like Sayyid ibn al-Musayyib and Hassan al-Basri and Awais al-Qarni. These three are the most prominent from this generation of Muslims. After this generation, you have the Atba' al-Tabi'een. Uttaba' Tabi'een. The next generation after them. And remember about these generations, the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam said, خَيْرُ الْقُرُونِ كَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best generation is my generation, the Sahaba. Then it's the generation after them, then it's the generation after them. ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ those that came after them, the second generation and the third generation, Tabi'een and Atba'u Tabi'een. The Prophet والسلام, also said about this generation, the second generation, Tuba li marra'ani aw ra'a marra'ani. Glad tidings, glad tidings for the one who has seen me. The one who looked at me and had Iman in me, good news for him, Jannat is for him. Ulama write, Tuba, Tuba. Tuba is a tree in paradise. And whenever Rasulullah said, Tuba li marra'ani, or Tuba, glad tidings, good news, Jannah. The Prophet is giving basharat of Jannah to these people. Jannah is for he who seen me, who looked at me. O ra'a marra'ani. O he looked at the one who looked at me. So the tabi'een that looked at the sahabi, that tabi'een will go to Jannatul Firdaus as well. One meaning of Tuba is paradise, another is glad tidings, as I've mentioned. Tuba li marra'ani aw ra'a marra'ani. This is why the ulama write, the sahaba tabi'een and atba'u tabi'een were the golden generations of Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam said, towards the end of time, the state of man will get worse and worse. The further we move away from the Prophet Sallallahu time, the worse the circumstances and situations will become. And it's very true. We are now in 1441 Hijri. 1441 Hijri in the Islamic year is 1441. The Georgian Christian year is 2019. So Islamically being in 1441 Hijri, 1431 years ago, the Prophet ﷺ passed away. 
in the last 1431 years look at the situation of muslims today a time when the muslims ruled the entire world from east till west there was a time islam spread from the arabian peninsula into yemen into syria into iraq then it went into turkey islam spread to azerbaijan islam spread to uzbekistan islam spread to afghanistan islam spread to hindustan islam went as far as china it entered into europe into hungary into bulgaria islam spread into spain went into france islam spread into europe into the dutchland germany holland scandinavia even islam came into the united kingdom and then from the united kingdom islam spread all the way to america and we see in north america south america islam has spread all over the world but where do we see islam practiced properly one may say pakistan one may say saudi arabia but the reality is though they are countries found upon islam they are muslim countries but there is little islam in them unfortunately look at saudi arabia now how much they are becoming westernized what's happening in jeddah and riyadh over 300 casinos have opened now boxing and mma and ufc and all the sports are going to go into saudi arabia we're going to see an influx of western influence into saudi arabia they are becoming modern and as they are becoming modern they are losing their identity of islam petrol dollars etc we see all of this that is happening but where is islam we don't find there is more islam in this country than there is there and that's the founding of islam yes you go to makkah mukarrama medina munawwara no doubt you will find islam that is islam the prophet وسلم, the kaaba baytullah musharrafa no doubt no denying no dispute but where is islam if i was to ask where where is the character of islam where is the essence of islam where is the appearance of islam you go into the the arab world for example the beard the sunnah of the prophet Rasulullah kept a beard, a fist long. This is a sunnah. You go into the Arab world, you will find less Muslim with beards. And you come into the United Kingdom of Pakistan, you will find more with beards. Just one sunnah, I'm giving an example of one. So this is why we see towards the end of time, there will be a lot of Muslims, but there will be little Islam practiced. Muslims are existent. We are nearly 1.8 billion of the world's population. They are Muslims, but where is Islam? Where is the character of Islam? Where is the way of Islam? Do we behave as Muslims should behave? The way Muslims are to behave? These are questions that need to be asked. And we see the best generation, the generation of Rasulullah wasallam, the companions, and then their students, the ones that followed them and the ones that followed them, they practiced Islam the best. That's why they are known as the As Salafu Salihun. The Salaf Salihin. They are the pious predecessors. And they are our role models, they are our examples. And amongst them, as I mentioned, Sayyid ibn al Musayyib, Hassan al Basri, Rabi al Basariya, we have people like Al Imam al A'zam Abu Hanifa. We have Imam Dar al Hijra Malik ibn Anas. We have Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al Shafi'i. These were great Imams. Great Imams that Allah Almighty bestowed great wisdom to, great hikmah. Allah Almighty granted them great knowledge. These are the pioneers of our religion. People like Imam Azam Abu Hanifa, Man Arada and Yatabahara fil Fikhi, Fahu Ayalun ala Abi Hanifa. Whoever intends to understand jurisprudence, the way Islam has been structured. For example, the Prophet وسلم, Allah said in the Quran, Akimu salata wa atu zakat, establish prayer. So if I asked you, tell me where in the Quran it tells us how to pray, the method of praying, 
You can't tell me. Why? Because it's not in the Quran. The Quran doesn't go into this much detail. The Quran has only told us pray. Allah has ordered us establish prayer. And then how do we know how to establish prayer? That's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Almighty said, do what the Prophet of Allah Almighty has been ordered to do. Follow him. How he prays, you pray. And that's why Rasulullah said, Sallu kama muni usalli. Pray like you see me pray. So they prayed. They prayed at times, as I mentioned in the past, they would raise their thumbs to their, their blessed thumbs to the blessed earlobes, at times to their shoulder length. At times it was merely Allahu Akbar. They would fold it here. They would fold it under their, their navel. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ let their arms down, so Allahu Akbar, and they would keep it down by their side. They wouldn't fold their hands in Qiyam. At times the Prophet ﷺ, before they went into Ruku, they did Raf ul Yadain. Allahu Akbar, then Ruku. Sami Allahu liman hamida Raf ul Yadain. Then they'd go into Sujood. When they get up from Sujood and they go for the second Raka'ah, when you stand up. The method of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, at times they used to sit and then with their knuckles they used to stand up, with their hands they used to stand up. This was a sunnah. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, prayed on different occasions in different ways. And whoever the Sahaba were, they seen this. When the Sahaba seen this, they went and told their students, I seen Rasulullah alayhi salam pray like this. They raised their blessed hands to the blessed earlobes. I seen them fold their hands under their blessed navel. This is how the Sahaba narrated to the students, the next generation. The next generation then narrated it to the next generation after them. Until it came to the great Imams like Abu Hanifa. People would ask and he said that I heard my teacher, Hamad ibn Abi Suleiman, who narrated from his teacher, Ibrahim al nakhai who narrated from al Kama ibn Qais, who narrated from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who seen the Prophet Sallallahu and they would raise their hands, they would fold their hands under their navel. So this school was formed, this methodology was formed, this way was formed. Sallu kamar aytumuni usalli. These great Imams, they were the pioneers, pioneers of our religion. When Masail came to them on divorce, on all these issues of fiqh, of uh, kalam, of aqidah, on all these different matters of religion pertaining to religion, they were the students of the greatest, the companions. They learned and studied from them. They always referred back to Quran and Sunnah. The Quran and Sunnah is our foundation, our basis. Everything we do religiously must be derived from the Quran and Sunnah. It must have a, it must source back to the Quran and Sunnah. We cannot say, I seen a dream and in the dream, this is what happened and this is why we do it. No. Our, our dalil, the adillatul arba'a, awad, Qur'an, sunnah, ijma' and qiyas. That's why we must stay within this framework. So these were the great imams. They understood the religion better than anyone. They practiced this deen better than anyone. They had the best understanding and they were the closest generation to the Prophet They were the closest to Nabi alayhi salatu was salam. We are so far from the Prophet Sallallahu time. Nabi Alayhi Salatu Wasalam said, towards the end of time, the state of man will get worse. The further away he moves from my time, the worse the circumstances and situation will be. By Allah, there's no denying that we are living in the most difficult and testing time. All the fitans of the previous umams of the last 14, 1500 years, all the fitnas of that time are prevalent in our time. Alcohol, homosexuality, drinking, smoking, womenizing, all of these things are prevalent in our time. All the fitnas are here in our time. We are tested the most. And no doubt, he who is tested the most, he who is tested the most, <coughs> will be given the greatest reward. It's easy for us to say, we should pack our bags and leave. Leave this country because there's too much fitna. Wherever you will go, fitna will follow in this day and age. Every turn you take, every direction you look towards, there is fitna there. 
whether it's a billboard, whether it's the town center, whether it's the homes, you are always being tested. And our iman should be strong in these times of difficulty. But Rasulullah told us towards the end of time, towards the end of time, practicing Islam will become so difficult for Muslims that they, as difficult as it is to hold hot coal, you know hot coal? To have hot coal in your hand, how hard is it to hold this? Eventually what will you do? You will let it go, you'll throw it. You'll say it's too much, I can't hold it, it's burning me. Rasulullah said there will come a time on Muslim, on the Ummah, where they will leave their religion. They will leave practicing Islam because it will become so difficult for them. And it is that at this time that we should try to hold on to the deen as much as possible. This is why we must go back to the Quran and Sunnah. We must go back to the way of the Salaf. We must go back to the way of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shaf, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Rahimahumullah. We must go back to the way of the great A'imma. And then after them, the great generations, the times of Imam Ghazali, Imam Sayyidina Abdul Qadir al Ghailani, the time of Sayyidina Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, all these great Imams that came. And from amongst them, in around the third century of Islam, there was one great Imam. He was born in a place called uh, Raz, Yahya ibn Mu'adh al-Razi. And he was known for delivering speeches. And he has phenomenal sayings. One of the sayings of Yahya ibn Mu'adh al-Razi, rahimahullah, something very important because if you remember last week, I spoke on protecting our hearts. Dhikr of Allah. Alladheena amanu wa tatma'innu kulubuhum bi dhikrillah ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'innu al-kulub. I focused my entire lecture on this ayah of the Quran. That those who believe and their hearts are content, certainly it is only through the remembrance of Allah that your hearts will be content. You see, our hearts... It's one of the most vital organ in our entire body. Even in relation to our religion, our deen. Because most of our intentions, remember, our entire deen is found on one of these hadith. Innam al-a'malu biniyat. Actions are found upon intentions. Our entire religion is found on this. Innam al-a'malu biniyat. It's the first hadith. Imam Bukhari narrates in his Sahih. إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى And for everyone is what he intends. Ulama write أعمال أعمال صالح Righteous actions are found upon intentions. You can stand up now and pray Salah. But if you don't make niyat, it's mere action. Your Salah will only be Salah you make this niya. If you do not make this niya with your tongue, you utter it or in your heart, it doesn't matter what namaz you read behind me. Your Jummah is not read. The condition of Jumu'ah, the condition of prayer, the condition of fasting, the condition of zakat, the condition of hajj. What is the first condition? Niyyah. You must have the correct intention. This is why Niyyah is very important. And where, where is the markaz of Niyyah? Where are intentions made? Kulubina. In our hearts. Intentions are made here and then expressed in our physical body. I made near to pray, then I did Allahu Akbar. If I say Allahu Akbar and I pray and I have no near, I don't define whether I'm reading Fajr or Zuhr, I'm reading Asr or Maghrib, I'm reading Isha. If I don't, ex if I don't utter these words that oh Allah, I intend to pray for your sake, the prayer of Fajr, two raka'ah, fard, behind this imam, facing the Qibla, Allahu Akbar. 
you, def- you have to specify the time, the number of units, etc. Nia is very important. Intention is very important. If our intention is not there, then our prayer is not there. It is a shart. It is one of the conditions of prayer. As is being pure and clean, making sure your clothes are clean, the place you pray is clean. These are all conditions of prayer. Your niya. The point I'm making is your niya is founded where? Where does your niya stem from? Your heart. Your heart is the merkaz. Everything is here. If your heart is clean, if your heart is pure. I mentioned last week, I don't know if I explained it clearly enough. We all, everyone says I have a clean heart. Oh, he's got a clean heart. He's a good-hearted guy. We really don't know what's in a person's heart. I don't know what's in your heart, what's in my heart. You don't know what's in my heart. We don't know what's in each other's heart. This is why Allah said, Allah Almighty, we people, we look at appearances. If he's dressed like a bad boy, we'll say he's a bad boy. We'll pass this judgment based on his appearance. He'll have a hairstyle in a certain way. He'll do whatever he may do. We will judge a person on his appearance, how he looks. If he dresses religiously, we'll say he's religious. He could be the most corrupt guy. He could dress like the worst guy on the street. He could dress immorally. No haya, no gherat in his dress. He could be wearing shorts. His legs could be showing half sleeves. He's out on the court. He could do anything. But he might have a good heart. He might be a nice guy. He'll stop. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? You are right. We, unfortunately, in the world we live in, we judge people on the appearances. Allah Almighty tells us, He doesn't look at people's appearances. On the day of judgment, He's not going to look at whether you wore shorts or whether you wore uh, sleeveless or you wore sleeves. He's not going to look at whether you had short back and side or whether you had a veg cut or you had a fade. It, Allah doesn't look at your appearance. <coughs> Do you know why? Because He knows everything that's inside your heart. He knows what's inside your heart. And your intention will become mani- will manifest. <laughs> Through your actions. The Prophet said, in the end, the, the last, how your khatima will be, it will tell you how your niyat were. If you have a good ending in anything you do, then it shows his intentions were good. Surely his intention was good, that's why he was doing this. And we see the Prophet وسلم, in his ummah lived a man called Yahya ibn Mu'adh al Razi. He said, Dawa'ul qalbi khamsatu ashya. Every person's heart is ill. There's not a single person here sat here who doesn't have illness inside his heart. Our bodies might be fit. We might go to the gym, we might bench press 150 kg, 100 kg. We might squat and deadlift 200, 250 kg. We might go to the gym and we might flex our muscles, we might do everything. But our hearts will always have an illness inside them. There will always be a bemari inside our hearts. Our hearts will get corrupt. We'll have jealousy inside it. We'll have hatred inside it. We'll have bugd inside it. We'll have all of these illnesses, illnesses of the heart, which develop because of society, because of our company. You hang around with bad people, that's what happens. You start to develop hatred for other guys. Why is he got a ground better than my round? Why is his graft better than... This is what happens. When you hang in that crowd, that's what happens. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam in his ummah, the Yahya ibn Mu'adh rahimahullah, he said the cure of the heart is in five things. He said, I'm going to give you five remedies, five medicines. I'm going to give you five medicines of the heart. Number one, he said, Kira'atul Qur'ani bit tafakkuri. The first cure of the heart is when you read the Qur'an, don't just read it. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Rahman, Rahim, Aliki, Wa Medini, Yaakin, Abdu, Wa Yaakin, Alif, Lam, Yim, Thalik, Al-Kitab, Al-Ariba, Fi, Udal, Al-Muttaqeen, Al-Ladheen. Don't just read it. He says, when you read the Qur'an, ponder over it. Think about the Qur'an. Understand what Allah is telling you when you are reciting His words. Kira'atul Qur'ani bit tafakkur. That's the first cure of the heart. The second, khila'ul batan. He said an empty stomach is one of the cures of the heart. And there's a reason for this. What we eat is what we will think. If we're eating excessive meat, eating haram, then it has a spiritual impact 
with our hearts. <coughs> Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi, in his book, Ihya Ulum al Din, he discusses this in great length and detail. The importance of fasting, emptying, keeping our stomachs empty. The more we starve ourselves, the more we are starving our desires, our shahawat. The more we starve our shahawat, the more our minds will think clearly. So the second cure to the heart is what? Eat little. Recite the Quran and ponder over it, thinking about it. And an empty stomach. The second one, or third one, Qiyamul Layl. He said that a person who wants to purify and clean his heart and remedy his heart, he should stand at night and do ibadat. He should stand up at night and worship Allah. What does this mean? Isha is at eight o'clock now. You go home, you may eat your dinner. After dinner, you'll sit with your family, speak to them for a while, your children, then you'll go to sleep. Fajr is at 6.30, 6 7 o'clock in the morning. Sun rises around half past seven. Before Fajr starts, which is around half past five, three o'clock, four o'clock, you wake up. You set your alarm, you wake up. You wake up and you make wudu. Your wife is asleep, your children are asleep, your mother and father are asleep. You look outside, everything is dead. Everyone is asleep. And you make niyyah and you do qiyamul layl. You do it for one night, two nights, three nights, four nights. Eventually you do it for 40 nights. It becomes a habit of yours. It becomes your nature. And you will see the lazat, the sweetness, the taste of this ibadah is better than any other worship. When you wake up at night and you connect with Allah, you talk to Allah, you cry to Allah, you ask Allah. At that time, du'as are not rejected. Every du'a is accepted. And what is Yahya ibn Mu'adh al-Razi saying? He's saying what will purify and cleanse our hearts? The standing at night. Qiyamul layl. Standing at night when everyone is asleep, you stand at night and you cleanse your heart. You ask Allah, Ya muqallib al-kulubi thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Make my heart firm on your religion. The fourth, وَتَدَرُّ عِنْدَ السِّحَرْ In the sahr. That you make dua to Allah at the time of suhoor. Sahri time, suhoor time is just before fajr. So you've done qiyamul layl and then you make dua at that time. Bil ashari hum yastaghfirun. Allah said when they did wrong, what time did they do istighfar? When did they do tawbah? At the time of dawn, suhoor. That time when the angels are present, they came and they made dua. And when they made dua at that time, those du'as were accepted. They made, did zikr of Allah and asked Allah and Allah forgive. And finally, Yahya ibn Mu'az al-Razi, he said, the fifth cure to the heart, and this is something my parents taught me right at the beginning of my life, and all throughout our life, it's the best advice. Because we are people who go out, we chill. We are people who go out and sit with people. But who do you sit with is key, Majalasatu Salihin. The fifth cure to the heart is sitting with righteous people. Salihin, righteous people. When you sit with good people, you will adopt good characteristics. You will become good as well. These are the five cures of the heart. Yahya ibn Mu'adh al-Razi mentioned and he said, and Yahya ibn Mu'adh al-Razi, when he mentioned this, it's recorded by in Sifatul Safwa of Imam Abu al-Faraj ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullahu ta'ala. My brothers, it's very important that we implement these uh, advices into our lives and we focus on our hearts and we focus on purifying, cleansing, remedying our hearts. Nobody sat here, nobody sat here doesn't have an ill heart. Every one of us would have some sort of illness in our heart. The best people to go to are the righteous people, those who are doctors of the heart. And I'm not talking about surgeons. I'm talking about Allah's awliya, Allah's righteous people. When you sit with them long enough, you will see all the illnesses inside you will be taken out. You will become humble, you will become relaxed, you will become easy. And that's the best way to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember, 
Allah will not look at how you look. He will not look at your clothes. He will not look at your hairstyles. He will not look at your beards. Allah Almighty will not look at this. Man will, but Allah won't. The creation will, but the creator won't. Allah only looks at your heart. What is inside your heart? Are your intentions clean? Your niya, everything stems from your heart. May Allah Almighty grant us pure hearts. May Allah cleanse our hearts. Ya Mukallib al Kulub, Thabbit Kulubana ala deenik, Wa Sarrif Kulubana ila ta'atik, Wa Akulu Kauli Hada, Astaghfirullah li walakum, Wa Akhlu Dawaya, and Alhamdulillah, Rubbil Alameen. If everyone can stand up, insha'Allah.